everyone, welcome to the Homegrown Artist. My name is Barbara, and today we're going to be reviewing the Zig Kudataki Gonzai Tombi watercolors. Uh, watercolors that are made in Japan and are traditional Western watercolors. Um, but before we get into any of the reviewing, I wanted to apologize for not being here for a couple of weeks now, I think it has been. Um, the 4th of July came up, and then my in laws. Um, came with a surprise but very welcome visit and then I ended up getting sick so it's been a while since I could record or upload any videos or anything like that. Um, so I know I've been in watercolor for a very long time now and I know I said on my channel that it would be a lot of different things, art, um, art journals, mixed media, stuff like that. Uh, so I think this is going to be close to the last watercolor um, video that I do because the next video will be an art journal using these watercolors. So it's kind of both. It's kind of just to tra transition into the art journal stuff. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that before we get into the review. Um, so these watercolors, I'll go ahead and zoom in and read what it says right here. So it says they're Japanese traditional solid watercolors. Um, so that right there lets you know that they're traditional Japanese style watercolors. And it says for professional artists and crafters. Um, generally when you get a paint, it's not, um, I mean you can use a professional paint for crafting stuff, but you wouldn't want to do that because you're spending tons of money on it. Um, so even though it says for professional artists, I wouldn't really say these are um, professional watercolors as you would think of in like America or Europe. They're not the same as traditional Eastern watercolors. They're very, very traditional Western watercolors. Um, and then it also says it's ideal for sketch, illustration, sumi, and more. Um, the way I use it is trying to learn sumi. -e. I have done uh, just watercolor sketching and using them in coloring books and, and art journals and everything like that. Uh, let me zoom back out real quick. Um, so like I said, these are traditional Western watercolors. They're made in Japan, handmade. Um, they're considered professional quality, um, is what they claim. Um, professional quality pigment inks. Now that leads me to think that either they're not made solely with pigments, they're made also with dyes, just because usually inks are made with dyes. Um, but if it, they call it pigment inks, then maybe that means that they use only pigments in here. But you can't find the pigment information anywhere, and even if you email um, email them to find out the pigment information, they still won't tell you the pigment information. Um, they will tell you that they are light fast, very light fast, um, but they don't give you any information to back that up. Uh, so as a traditional Eastern um, watercolorist, I would say that um, that's kind of sketchy just a little bit. Um, not for the company, I mean if they're making it for crafters and then selling it for that cheap, they don't have to tell you all their pigment inf information, but if you were to make a um, traditional watercolor painting with these, um, you wouldn't know the information that you need to know to sell it. You need to know the light fastness and some of the pigments that you're using and stuff like that. So I just wanted to get that out ahead of time. Um, so the Gonzai Tambi watercolors. Gonzai means watercolors in Japanese and Tambi means something along the lines of like pleasing or aesthetic or something like that. Uh, so basically it's just pretty and pretty to look at. And they come in different uh, size sets. I have the 24 color set here. And then um, I've seen people get them in a set of six, but I'm not sure if Kurataki actually um, makes them in sets of six. I'm not sh quite sure on that. But I have seen them for sale in sets of 12 all the way to 36. I wish I would have gotten a bigger set knowing what I know now about the paints. And especially, I'll show you in a minute about how big the pans are. They're amazingly big. Um, so when you first get the package, um, usually it has this little sheet of paper on the front of it. It's always in a cardboard box, um, and then it has like saran wrap around it. Um, oh, and then I forgot to mention that uh, depending on what size, like how many color sets you, or how many colors you get in your set, depends on the price. So if you were to get one for six dollar, uh, the six piece set that I've seen around some. Um, Usually they're like twelve to fifteen dollars, and then um, it goes all the way up to fifty dollars for the thirty-six set. But that all depends on where you buy it, whether you use a coupon, and whether or not it's on sale. Mine I just got from my local Hobby Lobby because I saw them. I was looking at the calligraphy stuff, and I was like, "Oh, these would be really fun to try." 
Um, so I picked them up. They were listed as 30 I think it was like $35 or $37. And then I used a coupon, so I got them for around $22 or something like that. I don't remember exactly correctly, and I'm not going to do the math. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it wasn't that, it for 24 colors, it was not that big of a price point. So, um, well worth the money that I spent. Um, so, I'm going to go ahead and show you uh, what you get whenever you buy the box. So you get this um, sheet right here that tells you about um, the colors and the numbers. So it has like a little circle that's supposed to represent the color, although it is not representative hardly at all. And then um, you get, let me just zoom in again on this right here. Um, some people's reviews that I've seen on YouTube have shown that they didn't have the name and they had to go look it up online. But mine, when I got it, and I don't know if it's just a Hobby Lobby thing or maybe because it's newer um, than when these first came out, they actually do have the name on there, so that's a good thing. Um, but they also have the color number that refers to the number that's also inside the box because there are no names of the paints inside the box at all. So let's zoom out again. So, when you get the box, it looks like this, although it's prettier than mine. I've had mine for a few months now, and I've been playing around with them like crazy, um, trying to learn the, um, like, one-stroke painting with the, the Chinese brush like this. I'm horrible at it. Um, it takes years and years of practice to get good at that, and I have just started, so I'm not that great. Um, and when I first started out, I tried to use these as traditional watercolors, so I just started this. Um, the one stroke Sumi E style painting um, probably like two weeks ago. Um, so then you open the box and of course like I said it's cardboard um, which is not very um, for like traditional Eastern style watercolors you wouldn't expect to get paints in a cardboard because you would need a palette or like something to mix them on um, and this comes with no mixing palette it comes with this plastic um, this plastic little tray here that it may take me for... Oh, no, I got it. It comes with this plastic tray that you can mix on if you want to while you're out on the go. Um, but it's kind of hard. It always beads up. And then, of course, you can't see... Um, because the colors are on transparent stuff, they look more transparent than if you were mixing it on a white mixing plate or something like that. Um, so they come in these huge pans. The pans themselves are, let's see if I can get one of these out. All right. So the pans themselves look like this. They're rather big. They're one inch by close to two inches across. Um, so you would think that you're getting a lot, a lot of paint whenever you see how huge these pans are. But then if you tilt them over, you can see that there's kind of an indent, quite an indent at the bottom. Uh, so that's paint you're not getting there. And then if you tilt it like this, they're only they're only halfway, maybe a little over halfway filled up. Um, so they're not exactly filled up, up to the brim. Um, and I think the reason that they're not quite filled up so much is one, paints dry when, uh, and shrink whenever they're put into pans. And two, um, the pans are made big enough and the paint is put in shallow enough so that you can put a brush like this, a giant brush in there, and kind of move it around and stuff without paint overflowing onto um, the plastic and the cardboard that the pans come in. Um, and then also the pans have a, um, like I said, there's no color name except for in Japanese, um, but they do have the number, the reference number. Let's see. So you can see number 44. And then when you go look right here, there's number 44. And then you can also come over here and look at number 44 and see what color it is. Um, so this is the color chart they kind of give you inside of the um, cardboard lid. Uh, mine's a little messed up. I made a mistake and tilted it and purple ran down everywhere. Um, so, and I wasn't too worried about it, so I didn't really clean it up. Um, so this is for like if you're on the go and you don't really know what colors they are because some of them are relatively dark so it's hard to distinguish the colors then you have that color reference right there you can also tuck in the piece of plastic 
and then tuck this into the box so it doesn't take up as much room as it normally would because it is a relatively big palette. Um, and I, honestly, I don't think it's made for travel. I think it's made for in the studio use or if you are traveling, then maybe more of a Sumi E style painting than um, traditional Eastern style water painting, watercolor painting. Um, and that's because with Sumi E, Sumi or Sumi E, I don't really know if I'm pronouncing it right. Um, with that kind of painting, you generally don't mix the colors, so that's why there's no palette. And then um, you just kind of load your brush with whatever color you want, and then how far up the brush you load it is how you mix the colors. Um, so that's one reason why the pans are so big, so that you can get in there and move the brush around um, however you need to. Unlike um, Eastern style pans that are really small, um, which, uh, in my opinion, can sometimes damage your brush, especially if you have um, a good uh, natural hair brush and you're mixing it in that small, small pan, um, it can damage your brush um, a lot quicker than if you didn't have to do that. So just the fact that I have these huge pans now made it worth getting this palette, honestly. These pans are amazing. And even on Amazon, if you go to get pans, um, just 10 pans cost $10. And here's 24 here for $20. So, uh, And they're huge. And you can pretty much put them in however you want, make palettes however you want um, with these pans. And then you can squeeze whole tubes into the pans themselves. Uh, another thing to note about Gonzai paint in, J in Japan, y you don't have tubes to refill them. Um, and even in the Kurataki Gonzai Tombi, you don't have tubes to refill them. What you do is you reorder um, the pans. And Walmart.com even now sells the, the um, entire sets as well as the refills. Um, I don't know if you can get a single pan, but I know you can get a three pack um, for relatively inexpensive prices. I'm about to have to um, refill this yellow right here. Apparently I use a lot of yellow and this is how I know that you're not getting tons and tons of paint in there. You're probably getting the same as a full pan, a regular full pan in Eastern watercolors. Um, so you're probably getting around five milliliters. But I've only been using these for about three months now and I've already hit pan right here. Um, so, um, but I also have been um, using it in the Sumi-E style, trying to learn that. And I think you use more paint doing it that way than if you were um, watering them down and um, doing it in the traditional watercolor paint. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I am going to swatch the colors out for you. I have this right here. Now mine, of course, have been used and have been used for a few months, so they don't look that pretty right now. But when you get them brand new, they are beautiful. And uh, the colors are very, very smooth. I did have one that was like granular, but it didn't affect the paint or anything like that. So the Gonzai Tombi paints, or any Gonzai paints, are kind of a mix between gouache and traditional transparent watercolors. Um, whereas um, gouache is very, very, very opaque, and traditional watercolors, most of them tend to be very, very transparent. Um, however, these are very... Um, are pretty opaque for watercolors like all of them are opaque and then uh, but you can water them down to where they are transparent so that's a good thing so you can use them um, especially for crafting if you're coloring or anything like that for traditional watercolor paint uh, and like I said before there's no pigment information or light fast information so I wouldn't try to do traditional um, watercolors watercolor paintings that you would sell um, not knowing that information all right, so what I'm going to do is, um, because they are opaque, just to test the opacity, uh, I'm going to get the thickest amount that I can, um, or the highest pigment load that I can, and go ahead and go over the name and the number, um, just to show the opacity. And if you look at some of the colors here, especially these two, um, you can tell that white was mixed in here. It looks like maybe white was mixed in here, um, probably a little bit in here, maybe not, I'm not sure. Um, but I do know these two right here are very much have white mixed in them. So yeah, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to speed through the um, color swatches and kind of talk about the colors as I go. And then after that, I'll do a review about the colors and let you know what I think about those. And then after that, I'll do a flow test. Um, 
And I did the swatch last night. I also heat set it so it shouldn't um, lift up very easily. Uh, but the Kurataki Gonzai Tombi paints are, they are very, very non-staining. They lift up very, very easily. So we'll just see after the, it being heat set and drying overnight, um, see if it lifts up and also see if it lifts up while you're glazing. So I'm going to try to lift up some and then also uh, try to glaze. And also, this is the color that looks most similar to like a phthalo um, blue, which is a very staining color. So I also wanted to test that out. Maybe they didn't use the same pigment as a phthalo blue, but it, it looks very similar. So I figured maybe it would be staining as well. Um, and then also, I'm going to show you how I mix some colors with the white. Um, because that's what this is made for, is to mix some colors with white. And um, the white also floats on top of most of the other colors, so it actually creates like these cool textures. Um, and then I'll talk about um, some mixing colors to make secondary colors. And then how easy it is to mix mud when mixing these colors, because that's not really what they were made for. Ergo, no palette. Um, so, I sounded really pretentious just now saying ergo. Um, so yeah, we'll go ahead and get into the color swatching and yeah. Alright guys, so these are the colors that we get with the color chart. We have a number 32 red, which is a very neutral, um, almost warm red. We have number 34, which is the dark pink. Um, it's one of the least least opaque paints in there, and it kind of reminds me of a conacridone rose. We have number 36, which is wine red. It reminds me of a lizard and crimson. And then we have number 31, which is a scarlet red, and it it's a very orangey red, so the warmest red in there. And then we have number 43, mid yellow, and number 40, lemon yellow, which are your general warm and cool yellows. Uh, we have number 44, which is light brown. Um, it kind of reminds me of a very bright yellow ochre. We have number 54, which is olive green, a very toned down and neutral green. And then we have number 51, which is may green. It's a very bright green. We have number 53, which is mid green, and it is kind of similar to a sap green. And then number 52 is an ocean green, and although it doesn't remind me of colors in the ocean, it is a very beautiful green. Um, and then we have number 58, which is evergreen. It's a very dark, toned down, um, beautiful green. Then we have number 55, which is very similar to either a phthalo green or a phthalo turquoise. And then number 57, which is actually turquoise green, but does not look green to me at all. It looks more like a, um, a blue color. Number 50 is pale aqua. It's a very beautiful color. And then number 61 is Cornflower Blue, um, also a very beautiful color. Um, however, you can tell both of those have been mixed with white. Uh, number 64 is what they call blue, but uh, it's very similar to an ultramarine hue, um, although it doesn't granulate as much as an ultramarine in this palette. Uh, number 62 is the Cobalt Blue, which reminds me of a phthalo blue. Number 67 is called Deep Blue, and it reminds me very much of uh, an indigo, a very bluish indigo. We have number 139, which is purple, very similar to a di dioxazine violet. Uh, number 46 is brown. It reminds me of kind of an earthy burnt sienna. However, it does seem to be mixed with white as well. Uh, then we have number 47, which is dark brown, and it kind of reminds me of like a raw umber. Uh, raw umber or burnt umber and then we have black which is just your general black although it's very inky and then you can see the white is not very opaque like in a gouache um, it does cover the black a little bit so I would say it's semi opaque rather than extremely opaque but overall they're very gorgeous colors and you get a good range in the set and they are very highly pigmented which is a very good thing um, although as you can see in this the flow is not that great uh, other than for a few colors. Alright guys, so it's been a few hours and I went ahead and let these air dry instead of uh, drying them with a heat tool just so that um, they'll dry naturally. Generally watercolors tend to do that a little better um, naturally than if you were to heat dry them. And as I was doing these swatches, I wasn't worried about back runs or them bleeding through or anything like that. Because um, that kind of gives you an idea of how the paints work and how they react and everything. So not a big problem for me. 
Um, but I did want to point out that um, when you do the swatches and you get the, the darker versions up here, um, because of the way that Gonzai paints are made, um, generally they're made with, um, instead of just gum arabic as their um, main binder, they um, tend to use, uh, especially in Japanese, Gonzai paints. Um, they tend to use like starch, glue, beeswax, sugar, glycerin, gum, um, as well as gum arabic. And it doesn't say anywhere what binders they do use in these paints right here. Um, but it's clear that they use some binder other than just gum arabic because um, whenever you look at the colors, let's see if I can zoom in and show you in the light. Let's see which color does it the best. Mid green and may green do it very well. Let me see if I can zoom in and then kind of angle the light there. And if you can see that, it dries to kind of like a shiny finish um, instead of in traditional either gouache or watercolors. Gouache doesn't dry to a shiny finish, just an opaque finish. And then a traditional watercolor um, would dry normally transparent. Um, and even if they were opaque, they would still have like a matte sheen. But these have kind of like a glossy sheen. Um, and the reason that that doesn't bother like traditional Japanese painters who use the Gonzai paints a lot um, is because they use different paper generally. It tends to be um, like rice paper or something like that. I'm not sure if it's just rice paper. I know it's special paper that they use for their sumi e painting. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that if you did want to use the color, um, the color itself without toning it down with another color or something like that to get a very deep version of that color, then you will get that shiny um, finish in your paints. Um, so yeah, I wanted to mention that. Um, they have beautiful, beautiful colors, and the reason, I've seen a lot of videos where people are like, why are there so many greens, and why are there so many purples and oranges, and in this set you don't get so many um, oranges and reds and purples. Um, you do get a good amount of blues, blues and greens, and this is because in um, Gonzai painting or in Sumi painting or traditional Japanese uh, watercolor painting, you don't really mix the colors. The colors are already made pre-mixed for you so that you don't have to worry about um, mixing the colors. You just dip the color into however, whatever color you want so that you can layer it on the brush. Um, so that's why, especially in the 36 set, you get like nine greens, seven blues, and I don't know, like four oranges. <laughs> three purples and a bunch of reds. Um, so I think that's the reason why they give you so many um, pre-mixed colors instead of as a traditional, instead of like a traditional Eastern uh, watercolor brand such as Winsor Newton or Daniel Smith or even Sennelier from France. Um, they would tend to give you a set of a cool and a warm version of a primary, uh, of all three primary colors and then some neutrals and maybe one or two greens or purples or oranges. Um, but because mixing is not really um, done a lot in the traditional sumi e painting, then I think that's why they gave so many colors that were already pre-mixed. And a lot, they do a lot of florals, so I think that's also why there's a lot of the reds and the greens. Alright, so now that we have thoroughly went over the colors that come in the Gonzai Tombi set of 24, we're going to get into some testing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and use this as the mixing palette because that's what came with the box. Um, it may be off screen a little bit. Um, so I already know from just first hand experience that uh, the Gonzai Tombi paints are not that great for um, flow, uh, like if you're doing wet into wet. They don't really flow that well. I'm trying to find a paintbrush, guys. I'm sorry. Um, so they do flow, but like say if you did just a wet and a wet. This is curled up, so I'm going to tape it down real quick. Alright. So, say we're doing just a general wet into wet painting. I'll take a couple colors. I'll take that um, dark pink, 
and see if it flows very well. And as you can see, um, it doesn't flow very well at all wet into wet like that. Uh, let's see, let's try another color. Let's try a green or let's just try a blue. That way if they mix, they'll make a pretty purple. So this color flows a little bit better. Um, not that much better. Um, so yeah, not very high flow when it comes to flowing like that. Um, however, whenever you just add some color down, and then you want that to flow by adding water to it, it generally flows pretty well. So if you can see here, okay, maybe that color doesn't flow pretty well. Let's try again. Let's try with the pink. I don't know what I just got in my paint. But eventually I will get it out. There we go. All right, let's try with the pink and see what happens. So there are some colors that flow relatively well. As you can see, when I did my watercolor test, uh, the wine red, I think, flowed very well and some of the green. So let me try that as well. It's driving me crazy. Let's see. Mid-green did very well flowing. Let's try that again. All right. Okay, no, it's just maybe the way I was doing it before they flowed well. Let's try some other colors. Just dropping them in to see if they flow. They flow if you help move them along. Mm. Let's try it up here. I'm just going to go right beside it with some water. Maybe I need a little more water than I'm used to with watercolors. So go right beside it with some water. It should flow in, flow out there. I'm pulling it out with the water. Um, so yeah, they're not very high flow. Um, some of the colors flow, and they flow better with themselves than they do with water. Um, so if you see up here where I touched the pink with the blue, it flowed very well in there. And then when I did down here with the two different colors, they flowed into each other very well. But with just water, they don't flow very well together. So that's something interesting that I haven't even um, realized until just now. All right, so now we're going to try a glazing test um, and then also a lifting test in the same kind of area. So I'm going to use a flat brush to lift some stuff off of here. Um, so just a moist um, flat brush. I'm going to move this over a little bit and move my paints to the right because like I said, I'm right-handed when painting. And get this as centered as possible. Sorry about lifting that tape like that. For some reason my paper got bent. Um, I have no idea why. Okay, so I have a moist brush and I'm just going to go through the paint. So that lifted relatively well and my brush wasn't even that wet. I kind of like patted the moisture off. So let's see when I have a very wet brush. So that lifts off very, very easily. Let's try glazing with a little bit of yellow. I don't want to use too much of it though. I want kind of like a watered down version of yellow. So that's where the palette's going to come in. All right, so we're gonna do that down here. And when you're glazing, you don't tend to go outside of the lines, but, uh, or um, use strokes this much. But if in case you have to, in case you're like, um, say you're doing like, uh, you're dropping color in, and then you have to move it around with your brush some to control where it goes, then 
um, you do have to move your brush around and go over the un the layer that's underneath and kind of um, move your brush around over it. And so when you are trying to glaze with these paints, that does become a problem because it does lift so easily. Um, let me zoom in and show you some of that. Um, because it does lift so easily, um, I don't know if you can see that the yellow has turned green. It glazed perfectly fine over the blue um, because we weren't going outside the lines, but if for some reason you did want to glaze over the color and you were moving your brush um, more than just like one stroke, then your color would lift up and mix with the color that you're glazing on top and you would get, here I did a light version of blue and a very light version of the warm yellow and uh, I got green. Um, so that can be a problem when you're glazing. Uh, now you can do a good amount of glazing without um, problems and let me just say that this was heat dried and left overnight. So um, it shouldn't have lifted up that easily. Even though it is student quality paper, it shouldn't have lifted up that easily, especially when glazing. It shouldn't have been that big of a problem. So this right here is a um, color page that I did with the um, Dilutions uh, coloring sheets. And you can glaze to a certain extent, but you do still lift that color up. You just have to realize that those colors do lift up. And sometimes it'll give you um, some problems like it did here and then right here. Um, it just makes it a little harder to control as you're working. Um, and that's my style of painting is either doing like a mixed media style, uh, not mixed media, but like a very loose style of watercolor or doing glazes like this uh, to make things kind of pop out. Um, and so you can get glazing done, but you can't get up multiple layers done or it will turn to mud. Um, and also, if you are trying to glaze, but you're doing like, say you're an anime artist and you're doing like, sh sh what's not sh, cell shading, then like if you wanted to glaze over that blue with another color, let's see, we'll do the yellow just for the fact that I used it already. Um, so if you're, if you know exactly where you want that color to be and you're not like pulling it out and you're not going over the same area multiple times, then you can go ahead and glaze and have no problems. And then also, while you're glazing, um, it's a very good idea if you know that you're going to want some color dropped into that area to go ahead and do it wet into wet um, so that you don't have to glaze again because then you're lifting up two layers of colors. Uh, and by doing it wet and wet, which my paper wasn't very wet, but by doing it wet and wet and, and kind of in a uh, cell shading style, then you'll have less problems glazing than if you were doing it like this right here. So like if you're a botanical painter and glazing is like your lifestyle when it comes to watercolors and you do multiple glazes, um, then this probably wouldn't be the best paint for that. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to mention that. You can get some glazing done um, and you can get some beautiful paintings done. Um, it just, it's, it's a lot more work and it is, it turns into mud a lot quicker. So now I'm going to show you some colors mixed with the white. And to me this is kind of amazing how it works because the white floats on top of all of the other colors. So it kind of, it looks really, really cool. So I'm going to mix some white and then put that next to another color. And I think maybe it floats on top because it's more dense than the other colors. Uh, that's a possibility. Let's use this, I think it's May Green. Yeah. So we're going to come in and add that next to it. And you'll see the white like just move on top of the, um, the other color. I'll add a little bit more white. It kind of dried relatively quickly. Because I am using the student quality paint here. So there's the white moving on top of the green. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit so you can see that a little better. And it kind of makes these really cool like cloud effects or like 
um, kind of like salt in traditional watercolors, except for it's white instead of salt. Uh, let's try another color. Let's try this, I think they call it cerulean blue, maybe? Cobalt blue. It looks like phthalo blue to me. Uh, so we'll try that. And then we'll try the white. <laughs> it's just so cool how it mixes on top. So if you were trying to do like I don't know, a sky or something like that. You could have your blue, which I may be doing something like this in my art journal just because it's so cool. Having the white kind of float on top of everything. It's a pretty neat thing. So you could get the white and then kind of like drop it in to make the clouds and it just spreads out really, really amazingly. So that's pretty cool to me. All right, so, oh, y'all didn't see that on camera, but look how pretty. <laughs> I'll drop in some more white real quick so that y'all can see it. It just flows in everywhere. It's really cool. And then also, if you wanted to do this, because they are there are already colors that are pre-made with white, for instance, um, let me zoom out a little bit. So for instance, if you look at um, this color right here and then cornflower blue, you can tell that pale aqua number 50 is probably green mixed with white and then cornflower blue um, especially the way it kind of granulates a little bit. You can tell that it is um, this color right here, the blue, mixed with white. Um, and then I think there's white in some of the other colors. I'm not quite sure. It just could be that they're th that opaque or that light. Um, it, it even looks like there's a little bit of white in this light brown right here. Um, so if you wanted to, or had the urge to, um, you could always mix the white with whatever color but actually mix it together instead of doing this but this creates cool effects in mixed media and in your art journals and everything like that so let's say you wanted a very bright and vivid um let's see this is dark blue maybe let's see, use turquoise green just made a mess right there. Okay. So we're going to use turquoise green, which is this one right here. So it may make a color similar to um, this one right here, or it, it may make a completely different one. But we're getting turquoise green, put it on our palette. Rinse my brush off. And then mix in some white. Oh, that's pretty. See, you can make really pretty um, colors with the white. And because these are crafting paints and not traditional um, Eastern watercolor paints, and with the style that these paints were made for, um, it's okay to use white, especially if you're using them for crafting or for. Um, art journaling or whatever you're using them for. Um, it's all up to your style. If you're one of those people who um, likes traditional watercolors and you don't want white anywhere near any of your watercolors, which when I am actually doing traditional Eastern watercolors that I am very much like that. But with these, um, since I use them more for crafting than for traditional watercolors, um, I don't mind using the white at all and it makes beautiful colors when mixed with the other colors. Um, all right, so I'm going to show you some mixing. Um, these colors, the reason that they give you so many colors in the set, so many um, secondary colors in the set, is because they were not made to be mixed. They were made, um, like I said, to load your brush and then load your brush with a different color, um, which I may show on another sheet of paper or maybe just down here a little bit. Um, but you can get good secondary colors. Uh, so if I wanted like a muted green, then I could take the mid-yellow 
and then uh, like uh, the blue number 64. It's kind of like an ultramarine blue. I think I already said that, but just in case. And then I can get a muted green. Let's say I wanted to make a purple, but I wanted to use, uh, I'm trying to think. Okay, say I wanted to make a purple, but I wanted to use number 50, which is this pale green, pale aqua. Um, and then I wanted to use the wine red. Then you would definitely get kind of like muted, muted muddy colors. And say that wasn't good enough for you for that purple, you wanted to add a little bit more blue to it. Then you're adding another color and then you're kind of still getting mud. Um, so these colors aren't as bad. I can't think of an example to, to actually create mud unless I'm trying to create neutrals. Um, so let's see. Let's try to make a neutral color here. So let's say, um, let's pretend this is ultramarine blue and this is burnt umber. All right, we got ultramarine. And then burnt umber. Okay, need some more blue. Instead of looking like the gray, um, like the the very transparent um, mid-tone gray that it normally looks like, right now it looks kind of like. Um, Actually, now I'm pretty sure that there is white in the burnt sienna looking color, the brown color. Um, because of the way this turned out, it looks like it has white mixed in. It's very, very opaque and um, pale looking. So you, it, it is just easier to make mud when you mix more than two colors. Um, when you're mixing the secondary colors from just mixing two colors, it's perfectly fine. It creates absolutely no problem at all. Um, but when you start trying to mix... Uh, like toning down your reds with your greens um, or turning down your pur toning down your purples with your yellows and stuff like that or mixing any of the colors that already have white in them with the other colors then it, it tends to be a little harder to start mixing colors. Um, so I have a little bit of room here for the traditional Sumi style painting um, just to show you I'm gonna show you maybe one petal because I'm not very good at it, and yeah, not good at it at all. Let me get a brush. All right, so you have, um, in general, they use either sable or goat hair brushes. Um, something similar to this. This is just a cheap set that I got from Hobby Lobby. Uh, it's the closest art store near me other than my other local art store. And uh, it was only $4 and then with the coupon $2 for three of the paint brushes like this. Um, so yeah, with, made with natural goat hair so that they bend at different angles so that um, you can kind of control it, your brush and you're supposed to hold it I think kind of like this so that you can have control over it with your wrist and circling your wrists and everything and like I said I'm not very good at it at all but we're gonna try something so I think what I'm gonna try is to make kind of like a rose um, petal so I would start by loading my brush with the white just made a mess on my olive green so I would load my brush all the way to the tip with the white and then um, kind of get the excess off the tip of the brush. And then go to whatever color I wanted to, to do um, to make the roses. So I think I'm going to go into this red right here. And I'm only going to load that red onto um, the onto half of the brush. And then I'm going to go into the wine red which is kind of like an alizarin crimson color but it's a, a cooler deeper red and get that on the tip of the brush so then you could take it and you could take your brush and kind of like drag it around 
and then you would have um, where you have darker values here um, and then lighter values out here and on traditional watercolor paper I think using the white doesn't really work that well because the white doesn't really show up like it does on the Japanese paper um, so I think maybe it may be better to use um, just water instead of white when you're doing the sumi thing. I've noticed that a little bit. Um, but then you can you can keep going, making whatever kind of petals you want. Water them down. However, I don't know. I'm not good with sumi painting. Um, you can add more color to the tip of your brush and kind of like. <laughs> I'm so not good at this. But that's the style of painting I think that these were made for um, more than um, traditional watercolor painting where you glaze and you layer and all that stuff like that. Um, but they are really, really fun to use in like your, um, your art journal or for crafting stuff. Um, I know like Lindsay the Frugal Crafter has one where she does flowers where she stamped flowers and then embossed them and then painted in there where it didn't matter really um, where the paint whether the paint flowed or not or if she needed to glaze because she was just it was already in that um, in that embossed area and then she cut it out and made a beautiful crafting supply with it so um, I think it just all depends on what you want to do with the painting uh, so it's kind of like uh, one stroke painting um, with acrylics but with watercolor. <clears throat> uh, so if you are already a traditional Eastern style watercolor painter and you are looking for a relatively inexpensive um, set of paints um, that are like the more expensive um, artist quality watercolor paints then I would not suggest getting these unless you're just going to use them to play around to practice controlling your water or anything like that because um, these are not they are transparent but they're more opaque and um, they don't mix the same way as traditional watercolors and then they have white mixed into the colors and of course if you buy the set you're buying a lot of greens and a lot of secondary colors that you that you wouldn't normally get in a traditional eastern style watercolor set um, now if you're a crafter and you're just using them in your art journal or you just want to play around or you're using them to color in a coloring book and you don't mind already having the, um, the pre-mixed colors, then that's perfectly fine as well. Um, so I would say um, that although they call these um, professional quality um, watercolor paints, um, for us in the USA or in Europe or anything like that, I think that these would be uh, more crafting paints. Uh, especially given the fact that they don't give us the pigment information or the light fast information like I said before. So I hope that was informative. I, I hope it answered all your questions about these paints. I know there are reviews out there but I haven't seen um, any reviews as thorough as this one so I wanted to go ahead and show you what I've learned as I was playing around and doing research. Uh, so if this content was helpful for you please do give me a thumbs up and click that subscribe button. And uh, if you have any questions or comments or just want to say hi, um, leave that in the comment section down below. Um, and I will see you all in the next video where I will be using these paints to create an art journal page. Um, which I think is going to be pretty cool. Especially, I like putting the white on top of other colors. Um, so, yeah, I hope you all enjoyed it and I will see you in the next video. Bye!